Hyundai has some advice for the competition. Move over. That's this week on Motoring 99. TSN's Motoring 99 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be. Beautiful, picturesque Quebec City, the scene for this week's edition of Motoring 99. Hello everybody, we're here to check out the 1999 Hyundai Sonata. Now, you know, it wasn't that long ago when Hyundai shocked Quebecers by closing down its big plant in Broma. So as a result, you might think Hyundai is a dirty word here, but au grand share. Of all the Hyundai vehicles sold in this country, 52% are sold right here in La Belle Provence. Now, naturally, Hyundai is hoping for big things from the Sonata, not only here, but across North America. But maybe just as important, Hyundai believes this new vehicle signals a whole new philosophy in the way this company sells cars as it continues to chip away at the competition. When Hyundai arrived on the shores of North America in the early 80s, it brought along one car to sell, the Pony. And it sold like hotcakes, and for one reason only, it was cheap. $5,000 got you behind the wheel. Despite its success, Hyundai has spent almost two decades trying to shed the Pony image. We don't want people to forget the Pony entirely. It what, it's what put us on the map in Canada. Uh, in 1985, we sold over 79,000 vehicles, and most of those were Ponies. So it's hard to forget that kind of success. But the new Sonata definitely uh, puts us on the map where we want to be, and that's a now a quality vehicle that we can compete with the competition, not on price any longer, but in quality and the performance. The differences between the 1999 Sonata and then our current 98 Sonata, uh, we've added more equipment uh, as standard features to, to the model, to our GL model. Uh, it's standard with automatic transmission and air conditioning, cruise control, 60-40 um, uh, rear seat. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a complete package and um, we've, uh, we've lowered the price by $500 on, on that model. So we're, we're, we want to be aggressive in the intermediate uh, uh, segment and, and I think we're, we're, we're showing that with the package that we've put together and, and the price that we've set it at. The Sonata is built in the brand new Asan plant in South Korea and rather than reinvent the wheel, Hyundai borrowed from the best. For example, the paint and body shop was modeled after Toyota's Kyushu plant in Japan which produces the Lexus. Uh, they've also borrowed heavily from plants in the U.S., such as the Belvedere plant um, by Chrysler and some General Motors plant and final trim assembly. We have made a lot of investment in the developing new products and improving the quality, and that's what we are trying to show the Canadian customer with the new EF Sonata. It also gives us the intermediate product that our customers that we now have that are now satisfied in the Accent and Elantra and Tiburon can move on up to that uh, intermediate uh, class car and, and so that's the missing link in, in, our, in our product range and, and now we have it and uh, we're all very, very excited about it. The powertrain is uh, two new powertrains, an all-new V6 which we call the Delta, is a 2.5 liter all-aluminum uh, V6, 60 degree narrow angle uh, packaging. And the four-cylinder engine is a uh, probably an industry-leading uh, in terms of performance, 2.4 liter, uh, also a dual rear camshaft with balance shafts. It's uh, totally new, all new sheet metal. Uh, not even a single bolt is carried over from the prior model. Yeah, this segment of the market is the biggest uh, uh, in Canada, and so in, w without us really being there and, and competing um, the way we should, it's, it's been very difficult for us. Um, we are going to do about 1,000 uh, Sonata sales this year. 
uh, we expect to increase that to at least 7,000 next year with this vehicle. It's just that good. Uh, we still have a challenge to get the public to change their perception somewhat of Hyundai as a as a low price, uh, good value company. Uh, certainly our value is there, but really, uh, really what we want people to think about when they think of Hyundai is quality. Uh, we're there now and with this car, uh, it gives us all the opportunity in the world now to attack that missing link in our product lineup. So we're very excited. Well, you know, Hyundai building good cars is a great start, but that's not all it's going to take. I'll tell you what else you need to do later on Kenzie's Corner. Up next, we test drive an ever-expanding universe. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the Daewoo Laganza. Now they got the name Laganza by combining two Italian words, eleganti and forza, which when translated means elegance with power. The Laganza is powered by a 2.2 litre double overhead cam 4 that goes by the name of DTEC. Sounds impressive and an awfully lot like Honda's VTEC until you find out what that gobbledygook actually means. And I quote, dynamic and durable technic engine. Boy, all I can say is it must have been a slow day in the old slogan department. That aside, the engine delivers 131 horsepower at 5400 RPM and 148 pounds-feet of torque at a respectable 4400 RPM. On paper, neither are bad numbers. However, out on the open road, the motor has a tendency to feel a little breathless at times. It also means that you'll spend the better part of 12 seconds to run from rest to 100 kilometers an hour. In other words, another 20 horses would not go amiss. The engine itself, however, is reasonably quiet, offers a decent idle quality and is a willing rever. Match with this engine is a four-speed automatic that features a power mode and a hold button. In essence, the latter acts as a lockout for the lockup converter. The shift quality and selection of gear ratios are good and the kickdown is willing to step in when you demand more power. Suspension-wise, the Laganza uses McPherson struts all round with roll bars at both ends. During the pylon test, the Laganza impressed. Body roll is subdued, understeer benign, and the response to steering input precise. Now, much of the credit for this performance is down to the oversized 205-60R15 Hankook tires. Capping off this surprising performance is the fact that the ride quality ranks right up there with anything else in this segment. Dropping the anchor also delivers a rather pleasant surprise. The pedal feel is crisp, is easily modulated and the standard anti-lock system does not intervene until it's actually needed. For the record, we measured the stops at 116 feet from 80k. Inside, the Laganza is loaded. You get leather interior, a decent stereo with a graphic equaliser, power locks, windows and mirrors that are even heated. The problem is, it's all marred by the very cheap plastic around the dash and the fact that the horn buttons look like they're about to fall off. The onboard audio equipment list also runs to a trunk-mounted six-pack CD player and a really trick graphic equaliser. While the latter is great for tailoring the sound, the display is so dim it's next to impossible to see during daylight hours. To keep all of that fancy audio equipment safe, they have an ultrasonic motion detector in this vehicle. What happens? If somebody breaks a window and reaches in, that movement sets off the alarm. Considering that this is a compact sedan, there's a lot of room back here. There's plenty of knee room, your feet actually fit underneath the chair, and six-footers have enough headroom. Elsewhere, the Laganza gets a decent-sized trunk, split-folding rear seats, and dual airbags. You know, aside from the rather silly name and the manner in which it was derived, the Laganza offers an awful lot of content for $25,000. Perhaps the only thing it's lacking, a few more horses. It's the uh, celebration of 100 years of uh, innovation by Renault. So we wanted to do a car which symbolized those 100 years. 
that's why we have this sort of characteristic Renault design approach, which is the one box design, which is the continuation between the hood and the windshield. And at the rear of the vehicle, that represents the first part of the century. It's the rather flamboyant bustle back, which one found in these coupes of the mid 1930s. And this car, in fact, there's a lot of it, I would say about 80% of the styling of the exterior, which you will find on a couple of luxury segment cars offered by Renault in the next two or three years. The car as such will not come out, but you will find both conceptually and stylistically elements, strong elements, coming out into production. So in fact, there's a lot more that will come out into production than most people believe. We uh, at Renault Design are modernists. We believe in the future. I personally believe that one should look at the future not through rear view mirrors. So consciousness about our past, our heritage, yes. Looking back, no. Our Midas tip of the week concerns engine oil viscosity. When you look at an engine oil container, you'll always see the viscosity clearly labeled on the outside of the container. This 10W30, for example, acts like a 10-weight oil in the winter time and a 30-weight oil when the engine's at higher temperatures. And 530, for example, acts like a 5-weight oil in the winter and a 30 when it's at higher temperatures. Now, there's a number of other engine oil viscosities as well. 10W40 and 20W50 are appropriate in some gasoline engines for operation at higher ambient temperatures. 15W40 is the oil of choice for most diesel engines, but 530 and 1030 are usually the two choices for most gasoline engines. Now the difference between starting and not starting the engine at minus 20 Celsius could simply be in the oil viscosity. 5W30 is by far the most appropriate for sub-zero temperatures and it's the oil recommended for most gasoline engines. However, 10W30 may be suitable for the summertime. If you've got it in there, as the temperature declines, you may want to think about switching to the lighter weight 5W30. Or for ultimate engine protection, a synthetic 5W30 gives you the very best performance. The lighter weight, lower viscosity oils assist in cold weather starting, lubricate the engine better during the first several minutes of operation, and marginally increase the engine's fuel economy at sub-zero temperatures. That's your Midas tip of the week. 450 anywhere, going once, twice, 425. What's your number, sir? Yeah. Number four, come forward with some money. Hurry up. Well, it's very simple. You uh, sign in, get a number, and then you stand there and wait until the uh, until the item comes up, the car that you want comes up, and then you put your hand up. And you keep leave it up there until I tell you to put it down. <laughs> what kind of prices are we looking at? Oh, everything starts at uh, usually $65 at base price, which is the price that the uh, scrap yards, scrap people pay for these cars. So they don't really care whether they're working or not. Uh, they'll pay $65 to, uh, to just to tow it away. And from then on, uh, it goes up. They average between $100 and $500, I guess. That's the, the majority of them sell from between $1 and $500. Now, at some auctions, when you go for the inspection, you can talk to the auctioneer or somebody else and get some insight into that particular product. Uh, are you helping people out? Are you a bit of a connoisseur when it comes to cars at all? Not really, because I don't know anything about these cars. They've come in, they've been here 90 days, and they've sat here. Where, where the, we don't know whether they run or don't run. And mo as you can see, most of them have flat tires, and they've been out in the elements for... 90 days, so we don't know what the condition of these cars are. What are you checking for? Floors. The floors. Make sure they're not rusted? Yeah, yeah well, a lot cars, of people uh, buy, when they buy yeah. these cars, right, they don't pop the back seats. And there's like yeah. rust in here, right? Have you ever got a deal on an auction? Good spot uh, to get a car? Not really here. Not really here. It's snowing, you guys. I haven't you noticed. Yeah. Anybody know what year this is? <laughs> Number seven. If you don't want this, can we do that? 79. 79? All right, I believe you. What should we say if it don't give me $100 for it started away? $100 all over the place. At $100 of it now, one and a quarter. One and a quarter now, one and a half. 125, 150 now, 175. 150 now, 175. At $200 of it now, two and a quarter. At $200 of it now, two and a quarter. At $200 of it now, two and a quarter anywhere going once. Try two and a quarter, new bidder now, two and a half. At 250 now, 275 anywhere, going once, twice, 275, now 300. 
At two seventy-five is all I'm bidding at three hundred dollars anywhere. Put your hands up. Three hundred dollars a bid at three and a quarter. Do as you're told. So how long does it take to, to put the new lock in so you can give them new keys? I don't put a new lock in. I take this one out and there's a code on it. And I cut a key from the code. It takes me about 15 minutes a car. I just pull it all out, cut the key and put it back in. Unless I run into problems, which quite often you do. Then they just start it and they drive away. Well, if it'll start. Here's some advice if you're planning a trip to Quebec and you can't speak the language. Bring along an English-French dictionary. Then at least you'll be able to read the parking meters and you won't get a ticket. Anyway, let's head to the garage. Join Bill Gardner. Brad, I hate to laugh at you, but don't give me this language problem stuff. You know you can't park in a wheelchair spot or beside a fire hydrant anywhere in this country or anywhere else for that matter. I'll bet you did one of those two, didn't you? Anyhow, uh, what I want to talk about this week are some of the items under the hood of your vehicle that, that if paid close enough attention to will help the performance and the safety of your vehicle during the cold winter months. One of the first things you want to do is check the antifreeze or coolant mixture. Make sure that you do this with the engine cool, no pressure in the rad hoses. Take the cap off, take a, a hydrometer and get some of the coolant solution up into the hydrometer. What you're going to check for is the cleanliness and clarity of this solution. You can see that this is a nice brilliant green and and nice and clear. That's how it should look when it's in good shape. If it's cloudy or dark color, it needs to be flushed. Or if it's more than about three years old, it should be flushed and replenished. This one's good for minus 45 uh, freeze protection. We've got plenty of freeze protection. Remember, if you're adding solution to the rad during the winter, make sure that you, you mix the antifreeze 50-50 with water. You can go a little bit stronger than 50-50 if you, if you want, but don't put pure antifreeze in the, in the cooling system. Uh, another thing you should do is take a piece of crayon and mark the freeze protection and date you checked it on the rad hose just for future reference. Down here where the upper rad hose connects to the engine is another very important part of your cooling system and that's the thermostat. This regulates the minimum operating temperature of your cooling system, tries to keep it at at least 195 degrees Fahrenheit. And when this thing's working properly, you'll get good heat out of your heater, adequate heater performance, and reasonable fuel mileage. If it isn't working properly and the engine's running too cool, you'll waste fuel like crazy. And on really cold days, you'll have to turn that heater control all the way up to get even lukewarm air. This thing is pretty inexpensive and it fails on a fairly regular basis, usually sticks open and runs the engine too cool. So if you're in any doubt, replace it. Some vehicles have a system just like this one right here to preheat the air coming into the air cleaner. Whether they're carbureted or throttle body fuel injected, they may have a system somewhat like this that preheats that air. It's very important that if your vehicle has this kind of a system that it's intact and functional. Any deficiencies in this system are guaranteed to cause stumbling, stalling and hesitating on damp cool days. It's very important that this thing works properly. Not all vehicles are equipped with this, but if yours is, it's a very important thing to check out. A good strong battery is obviously very important to the winter performance of your vehicle. Now if you take your car into a repair shop, we're going to test it with a machine just like this, a battery load tester that reads the voltage at the battery terminals under load. What this thing does is it, it uh, applies a, uh, a load across the battery terminals of several hundred amps to simulate a loaded condition. There's a couple of hundred amps, 200 amps of load. We flip to the volt scale and we can read that it's got just a shade under 11 volts at that load. Before you do any testing on a battery, you should make sure that the terminal connections are clean and tight. If they're at all dirty or corroded, clean them up first before you do your testing, including the ground strap down on the engine. Now, if there's any acid mess across the top or sides of the battery, wipe that off with a paper towel and dispose of it carefully because it's corrosive. That uh, acid mess can lead to discharge of the battery as well. Now, if you don't have a machine like this, a load tester, and obviously most of you aren't going to have one, you want to do a simple test on your own battery in your own driveway. Just turn on the parking lights for about 20 minutes or half an hour, and then try and start the car. If the car just won't start, the battery's really weak, and it, you just get that clattering sound or it won't crank at all, that's a bad battery. You've got to go out and change that, replace that, so that you've got a reliable electrical system. Because there may be situations during the winter where you want to run accessories or lamps like the four-way flashers, for example, if you run out of fuel or have to change a tire, you have to run the four-ways without the engine. That battery's got to be able to sustain the electrical system without the engine running. So this is a good test for it. And believe me, 20 minutes or so with the parking lights on will weed out the men from the boys. Now, if you've got any other problems with your car that we're 
that were giving you problems during warm weather, address those as well because they'll only get worse. These are only some of the items you want to look at during the winter. There's others as well, but these are some of the key ones. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 99. You know, people laughed back in 1995 when we showed up at the racetrack with a Hyundai Accent. Sure, the car wasn't fast enough to win, but it handled great, had tremendous brakes, and the thing was tough as nails. The following season, we showed up with an Elantra, and it took a supercharged Volkswagen Corrado to beat that car. The year after that, we came with two Hyundai Tiburons and the Elantra, finished one, two, three in the championship, and in 1998, Tiburon won the championship again. Now, Canadian showroom stock racing isn't exactly the 24 hours of Le Mans, but the point is Hyundai took on all comers and beat them fair and square. It's part of the company's attempt to build an image for themselves. They realize they can't just build cars that people have to buy because it's all they can afford. They need to build cars that people want to own. And with the Accent, Elantra, Tiburon, and that new Sonata, they're pretty much there. But Hyundai knows it's going to take more than that. They need to upgrade their dealership facilities, more modern places like this. People don't want to buy cars out of a trailer parked in a muddy parking lot. They want a modern, up-to-date facility like this place. Hyundai is also dealing with the fact that a lot of their customers over the years really couldn't afford to maintain the cars properly, and that reflected itself in the reliability record. Now, their warranty costs are down, the customer satisfaction is up, and they're in it for the long haul. Are they going to make it? I, for one, am not going to bet against them. I'm Jim Kenzie. Hyundai says it is no longer trying to catch the competition. It is trying to surpass it. Have they done that? Well, after a couple of days in the new Sonata, they've definitely caught up. The quality is there. And when it comes to the base model, the competition will be hard pressed to meet value for money. Needless to say, Hyundai feel they've got the best car in the intermediate segment. All they have to do now is convince you of that. That's it for now. We'll see you next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Mom and Dad put us in the back. Uh, we probably played alphabet games and kind of pulled at each other and hit each other. I had three sisters, and we did a lot of uh, a lot of arguing and fighting. And Mom and Dad were constantly a little stressed out. You know, you got through the trip, but you got through it a little bit stressed out. But with the Premier system, it allows everybody to kind of find their own space. TSN's Motoring 99 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.